way I <coughs> many things happen today. So, right now, that's so, uh, first, uh, first of all, let me remember what was the problem <coughs> point where we got at the end was the following. We had to discuss the problem of uh, minimizing an energy functional <coughs> for functions defined on the line and uh, function have to be the space H1. Space H1 is the natural space where the energy is defined. Because the energy, I remember, is the sum of two thirds. One is uh, line, so the L2 norm of the prime derivative of U, so we need H1 minus 1 over B LP norm to the fifth power. So, so this is the energy for this energy function on H1 is the natural space. And now we accept it because I told you without any sort of proof, but we accept it that there is the minimizer, and uh, of course there is a constraint to be added here. This guy here, the other norm is equal to some positive value. So there is a minimizer. There is a function that solves this problem. And uh, basically we have to find it. And I, I remember that uh, I was talking about minimization. So uh, after the lecture I wrote some very elementary slides. This page is uh, some sort of analysis one on analysis two. So if uh, we have a, a function of two variables, f, and uh, the point x bar, y bar is a stationary point, and all minima are stationary points, then the gradient of f computed at the point must be equal to zero. Second point, if uh, x bar, y bar, is a stationary point not of the free function, but of the constrained function. So we evaluate the function just along a curve, g x y equal to 0. Then the condition of stationarity is that uh, the two gradients of f and of the constraint g must be proportional. This is expressed in this form here. The gradient of f parallel to the gradient of G, but all stationary Okay, so this is very elementary, and this is done in R2. The generalization to functional is nothing but the generalization of this schema to infinite variables, if you want, to an infinite, in an infinite dimensional setting. This is, this is the, the main idea. So, now, point, uh, stationary point is a function. A function u bar, free stationary point u bar of a function at e must uh, satisfy gradient of e computed on u bar is equal to zero. But what is this gradient of e? Gradient of e we compute it by using this e, this uh, uh, evaluation of the function on u plus e phi. The gradient is nothing but a linear function. Of a, of a function is a linear function and the gradient of a non-linear function is a linear function whose action on phi is the following. Remember the computation we performed today this morning. There is a, a kinetic term written like that, so it is a quadratic form in u and phi, and then there is the non-linear term that we have. So if there is no constraint, so free stationary form, then simply Gradient of e in u bar equal to zero translates to this equivalence. Okay? It's an integral equation, very simple integral equation. And uh, of course, gradient of e of u bar equal to zero independently of phi. So for every phi, this equivalent is for this stationary. But now we have a constraint here. So we introduce a constraint. A constraint. So for a constant stationary point, u u bar. And in perfect analogy with the, with the finite dimensional setting, we have that the gradient of E, which is now a linear function, must be proportional, must be parallel to the gradient of G. 
Okay. What is lambda? Lambda is a real number. When uh, when solving this uh, this problem, lambda will be an unknown. Will be uh, what one is asked in the mind. But the idea is that the two planets must be parallel. Remember, because in order to be stationary in a curve, it is not necessary not to grow, but it is uh, necessary to grow perpendicularly to the curve. So, in our case, here we have, uh, we have uh, the g of u, g of u is equal to 0, so the L2 norm of u minus mu is equal to 0, means that for every phi in H1, the gradient of u bar computed on phi is equal to minus some lambda, the gradient of g, which is the same, this is the integral equation. But now, this morning I promised you a differential equation, so let us pass to the differential equation. And it's sufficient to, the, so notice that simply the formula we wrote before is the same here. I just put the lambda on the, together with the, 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 the same sign with the other terms. So what happens here is that the first time we have a, a prime derivative of phi, and here and here we have just the prime derivative. Integrating by part, we gain a minus here, and the second derivative of u bar, but here we gain so the boundary time goes to zero because here we're dealing with H1 function. H1 function disappears. Okay. Here we get this, this sum so, so that we can get uh, this V outside the parentheses and since this integral for stationarity, uh, sorry, this is U bar of four, must be equal to zero for every V, then U bar must solve this equation. What is here in parentheses must be equal to zero. Again, this is the value. Okay. So here, this is the differential equation we are interested in, and we are going to solve in order to, to compute, if possible, the shape of the minimizer. Okay. So, uh, so as you are experts in quantum mechanics, you here for sure recognize the stationary nonlinear Schrödinger equation. Okay. This is like a sort of a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. So it's a stationary Schrodinger equation, but the operator here is not the But uh, in the setting, uh, this equation turns out to be the orbital Lagrange equation for the energy function. So it's kind of uh, it's a differential equation, not now we, we go we are going to, to solve it. And uh, so <coughs> this is the equation. Okay, it's the same I wrote before, but I isolated the second derivative term here. This is, this is quite important because uh, now I'm going to understand, uh, to interpret uh, this second order, uh, this uh, Schrodinger equation in another way. First of all, let me just change the notation. This u bar, let me call it y, not the address, and x, let me call it t. Just a change of notation, but I will interpret now the independent variable here, not the, uh, as being the state, but as being the time. Just change, change the symbol, and uh, this equation becomes this one. It's exactly the same. And uh, notice that uh, here, the, this, uh, this term here I, can be written as minus the derivative of this point, which is very simple polynomial, y to the fourth power over 4 minus lambda y to the second power over 2. So this guy can be interpreted as, as a, a classical mechanics equation. So this is the equation of motion for a point particle of mass equal to 1. This is mass is not here, so mass is equal to 1. This is the acceleration on a line denoted by the coordinate y. And under the action of this potential. Okay. And this is this can be studied with methods, okay. with methods of classical mechanics. And this is what I'm, what I'm going to do now. I will use the Y for from the model. And uh, what I will do is uh, it's very simple and very standard, but I hope that uh, it will be not so boring and uh, not, not so useful. But if you, if you, everybody knows what, what I'm going to do, just tell me, okay, uh, skip this and go forward, okay? 
what I tell you, what I'm going to do is simply to, to start with this potential. The motion generated by this potential. Okay? This of course there are two cases. Uh, the first case, quite simple, lambda less or equal to zero. It's very easy to draw a graph of the potential B because it's a nuclear potential and it is the sum of two positive terms which are monotonically increasing for positive value of, uh, of Y. And so, so this is It's not a harmonic oscillator, but the, the potential is a, it's a single wave well potential like that. And so, if I ask you to, to describe with a, one word the motion, all possible motion uh, allowed by this potential, which is the word that you use? Sorry. This conservative, that there, there is no. But for example, if I fix a value of the of the energy H, I call it H because this is a mechanical energy which has not a, a direct relationship with the, with the energy of the analyzer. Okay, at the energy H, how is the motion here at this energy level? Okay, this is a periodic motion. Okay, the word I would use is periodic because, for instance, if you start at this y, at this level of energy, with a speed, with a positive speed, then you have uh, that this height gives you the kinetic energy because this is the total energy H. This black guy is the potential energy. All of this is the kinetic energy, so there is a positive speed. And the speed pushes the point up to when the speed is equal to zero. So here. Here there is a turning point because the acceleration now is leftwards and the motion is like that. And then the motion is again like that. And the motion repeats it, it itself with the same characteristic when passing at the same point. Once forward and once backward. So the motion is periodic. All solutions to this, equ to this equation for lambda less or equal to zero are periodic. Okay. I very rapidly draw a baseball train. This is y. This is y of, of this motion. We we have a typical. This will be very symmetric. My drawing is very bad, but this is this is symmetric. So this is a periodic motion. Now my question is: Is a periodic solution? can be accepted as a good minimizer or a good stationary point for our functional. When a teacher asks something like that, the answer is always no. But why? Remember that we are looking for function in H1 of R. You really have to go to zero at infinity. Periodic non trivial solution cannot be in H1 of R. So, by the simple but qualitative study, we immediately have the information that lambda less or equal than zero gives no solutions <coughs> for the NLS problem. Of course, they are solution of the differential equation, of course. But they are not no solution for our problem. They are not in H1. Okay. So, if you have questions or comments, or just uh, this is very easy, don't be afraid. So, the second option is when lambda is greater than zero, and here the shape of the potential is very different. Because if lambda is greater than lambda is greater than zero, here we have a negative contribution of y squared that dominates around the origin. So what happens is that we have a double world potential. If 
you have a double well potential. So, again, we have a lot of periodic orbits. For example, if the energy, if this is the energy level, the orbit will be periodic. Okay, here. But also here, in correspondence to this value of the energy, we have a cap of periodic orbit. Now, my question is, are there, in this case, some H1 solutions or not? <coughs> Does anybody see? The answer is yes. Does anybody see? So everything seems to be very periodic, except that notice, notice that here, here there is a maximum. Having a maximum at a qualitative level means that uh, if, uh, for example, I start from here towards the maximum, the decreasing of the kinetic energy here is very different from the decreasing of the same kinetic energy when, when the, the point where the energy level meets the potential. In particular, the kinetic energy here decreases more slowly and what happens is that going to going to reaching to this point takes an infinite amount of time. This is the main point. So what happens here is that uh, in correspondent to, to this age, of course, you have uh, this periodic orbit. Huge age, this large age. In corresponding to this age, you have two periodic orbits, one at positive values of y and another at negative values of y. Of course, here and here you have two equilibrium points. But uh, in corresponding to the value h equal to zero, then you have a couple of orbits that are always like that. A couple of I will explain how many orbits are. So first of all, here we have uh, no, it's, it's not one orbit, not two orbits. In the, this curve, this eight-shaped curve, we have three orbits. Okay? One is for negative values of y, one the other one for positive value of y, and also the point of zero is an orbit. So we have three, three different solutions. Of course, they are not only three, they are infinite, but three modular translations. Okay. Then, furthermore, can be explicitly computed, but what happens is that in order to complete, in order to get away from zero and to get back to zero, the time needed is infinite. So we can, we can draw, from this picture we can draw a qualitative graph of the corresponding solution, time y, for example, this solution here, the positive one. And we have that minus infinity, the particle is, goes to zero, then it reaches its mass maximum at some point. Here, I draw it at zero, but uh, it is not necessary that it is zero. It can be done same. But the shape of the function does not change. For example, the maximum can be here, and then the function decreases again towards you. This is symmetric in principle because this orbit is symmetric. So, so this is the shape of the function. And this function, this function has some possibility of being each one. Okay? All other solutions, all other solutions are not each one. There is one possibility here in this orbit which is called the separatrix and uh, um, because it is not periodic, it, it is asymptotic and uh, there is another orbit which is the negative one and so let us consider the positive one. In order to see whether it is uh, H1 or not, okay, one can proceed by quantum uh, arguments too, but uh, let me try to solve the differential equation in correspondence to, correspondence to H equal to zero and lambda equation in this case, it is possible. Okay. 
So there are questions, is it, uh, is it well, well regarded this base for play stuff in classical mechanics? Different ones. But if you, if you never saw something like that, now I come back to differential equation and rewrite this differential equation in, a, in another way, exploit it in what your colleague told me before, that the system is conservative. Do you 
perform an integration which is not too messy, let me choose uh, lambda equal 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 to one half. It is not the, there is no loss of of generality. That's probably we will see again. Okay. Lambda is equal to one half, so we have that dp dy is equal to one over square root of two, one over y squared minus y to the power. Let me integrate in dy of terms. So here we have that uh, this is just an integral of dp. Let me write dt. And here we have uh, 1 over square root of Now, there are various methods in order to integrate it. The possibility is to change of value to, to perform this change of value or y is equal to sine of uh, let me call it uh, let me call it uh, z so that <coughs> this integral gives t is equal to 1 over square root of 2 dy gives cos z z is at, uh, and here square root of uh, the square of sine of z minus uh, times y minus sine to the square of z. Okay, z can be choose, chosen between zero and one, uh, zero and p over two, because here y. Is so there is, there is no problem with sine of mobile or something like that. So you immediately see that this guy is cos squared under the square root. It is a cos, so this guy cancels this other guy. So we end up with 1 over the square root of 2 integral. This is over sine of z. Okay. This is a famous integral and gives 1 over the square root of 2 of 2 log of tangent of z over 2. There is no need of uh, absolute value here because, uh, because of this class and the feature in constant. Okay. So in integration of the main, except that we, we perform some substitutions and so we have to go back in order to, to recognize a function. Here we can 
cancel here the square root and put the, oh sorry, it was not a square root of 2 that I took from the integral, but it was a square root of 2 here. From the very beginning, when I get a this, this one of a square root of 2, it was a square root of 2. Now, because I took a a square root from, uh, from the logarithm, there is a factor 1 over 2, so we gain again at 1 over square root of 2. Okay. This square root of 2, let me... There's a plus in the denominator. Uh, there's a plus, okay, yeah. Thank you. This is, this is a difficult part. And uh, so, if I take C, I put it here, together with the t, and here I have a square root of 2. It should be correct, OK. OK, now when we have the log, we simply expose the shape. So this point is equal to e to this point. And now we have to isolate this square root. And you can see that. Uh, you can start to hope that this, uh, that this solution can be explicitly written. And uh, first, let me isolate uh, this uh, term here, square root of 1 minus y squared. Okay? I isolate it and I put here, so there is uh, This e to the square root of 2 time t minus minus c. And then there is also this guy, when I put it here on this side, it gives a plus 1. This is equal to to 1. Remember that y is positive, so we have that y is equal to 
2 e to the e minus c over square root of 2 because I took the square root here and here there is 1 plus e square root of 2 e minus c and now I can divide by I can take the numerator and put it here and put it here and I obtain First I write the second term e to the minus e to the plus, sorry t minus c over square root of 2 minus, uh, plus e to the minus t minus c over square root of 2 This is incredible but it is correct at the end What we obtain is uh,
that this was found just for a fixed value for lambda. Lambda equals to one half. And what about the other values of lambda? In particular, our problem was another one, was fixed mass. And then the mass gives you such a system, and this system will give you lambda at the end, not fixing lambda. But now I, I stop with the computation, I give you the result, but you can perform the computation by yourself. So the computation is the following. If, let me call it uh, phi 1 of t, of t minus c. Okay. So phi 1 is centered in c. We have that the help norm of this phi 1 to the square, so the value of mu of the mass for which we have solved the problem, is uh, 2 square root of first observation. Second observation is that uh, if we consider family of functions that may write as v nu is equal to nu this v1 us. So as today we are just uh, shrinking and making it, it, uh, it uh, taller. Okay. Then we then we get then we get that the new solves the differential equation of our differential equation here.
So we go from concentration compactor that exists a uh, minimizer. Fixed mu. But so fixed mu and then concentration compactness, the abstract fact exists a minimizer. Moreover, there exists a unique stationary state on the road. This has been made by hand. Since the minimizer is a stationary state, then the stationary state continues is the minimizer. shape, instead of using this trench, you will use uh, a formula that will be useful tomorrow too. And, uh, the formula says that all positive solutions to the minimum problem, let me change uh, the, the, the level here, the minimum problem of the line are made in this way, mu over 2 square root of 2 hyperbolic segment of x over 4 and translations. Of the immediate cons consequence of, a, of this fact is the last thing I, I want to say today is the following. Consider the problem not on the line, but on the half line. The problem of minimizing the energy, the same expression of the energy, to fix that unit. So this is a half line, draw it left to that In any case, this is the half line. And, uh,
Yeah. yeah. Factorize the, the y squared uh, Factorize. Factorize. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can factorize it. Uh, then we, we can get the, the, the equation to be y squared bracket y squared minus 2 lambda. So we can use the identity to become set to pi uh, lambda.